Welcome to Relation Tales, please like this video. And subscribe Relation Tales. Today's video is one I never expected to make. A story of love, betrayal, and an unexpected turn that forever altered the course of my 28-year marriage. For 15 months, my wife carried on a secret affair with plans to start a family with her boyfriend. The twist, I was aware of it all along. In this video, I'll walk you through the heart-wrenching details of how this unfolded and how, in the end, deception taught a harsh lesson. Stay tuned as we explore a journey of resilience, self-discovery, and the consequences of unfaithfulness. Let's dive into this deeply personal chapter of my life. I'm torn about whether I can bring myself to cause the pain I know I'm about to inflict on an innocent party who doesn't deserve what's about to happen in the next half hour or so. However, as I gaze at the large, meticulously framed photograph of me and Dave on our wedding day, Hanging above the mantle, my tearless eyes reflect the emotional toll of my mostly happy 28-year marriage. Those tears were shed during the internal debate on whether to proceed with this conversation. The verdict is yes, but I'm still resisting the urge to flee. Dave is going to be devastated, seated beside me on the sofa. John gives my hand a reassuring squeeze, boosting my courage. I glance sideways at him and smile in gratitude. Over the 15 months of our affair, I've gradually fallen in love with him, and I'm aware that every bit of love I've given him has been taken directly from Dave. The moment it felt like cheating on John to make love to my husband marked the beginning of preparations for this meeting. I'm not looking forward to it, but I anticipate relief afterward. I'm going to hurt Dave profoundly, unavoidable as it may be. Yet once it's over, I can end the charade, pretending that I'm as deeply in love with Dave as he clearly is with me. Pretending to go out with my girlfriends, on work trips, clothes shopping, all the while meeting up with John. It's incredibly stressful, and a significant factor in the worry lines increasingly visible on my face each morning. I look forward to the release. I glance at the bookcase, ensuring the baseball bat I discreetly placed there earlier is still in position. Dave's stance on fidelity is well known to me. Since the kids left home, he's been engrossed in reading short stories detailing the repercussions faced by cheating wives. Some of these stories shocked me with the husband's intense reactions, making the wives pay a heavy price for their actions. When I inquired about it, he casually mentioned colleagues who went through upheavals after sharing similar stories. Update, Dave, by nature, isn't a violent man. But when confronted by the person jeopardizing his happiness and future, he might make an exception. With a physical stature surpassing John's in size, fitness, and strength, and a less sensitive demeanor, Dave holds a prominent position in a biomedical company, presenting a stark contrast to John, who is an artist. Despite any provocation, I'm confident Dave won't physically harm me, allowing me to keep him at a distance so John can escape. As I hear Dave's car pull into the driveway, my stomach churns and my heart pounds. I swallow, needing to steel myself for what comes next. Deep breath. I wonder about his thoughts on the unfamiliar car, John's car. I sense that Dave must have read a similar scenario in a cheating story, the first one I ever read. My heart rate increases. I must stay calm. Dave walks in, eyeing John with curiosity. I stay seated, avoiding kissing Dave in front of John. Dave notices my omission and approaches with an outstretched hand. He introduces himself as Dave, and John hesitates before a brief handshake. Dave discreetly rubs his hand on his pants, a gesture I recognize after so many years. John retreats to the couch. Dave grabs a beer, sits opposite us, takes a pull, placing the can on the coffee table alongside our glasses. The tension makes my nerves feel on the verge of snapping, like a branch pushed beyond its limit. I can't meet Dave's questioning gaze. Instead, my eyes flit lower to his casual attire. When did he start coming home dressed so casually? I shake off inane questions about clothing. Now is the moment I've been dreading, where I shattered the soul of an outstanding community member, terrific father, provider, and nearly perfect husband. The first love of my life, but not the last. I admit that we need to talk to Dave. He responds with a neutral, unreadable expression. As expected in pressure situations, he remains coldly analytical, thinking on his feet better than I do. Despite preparing for every angle, my nerves betray me. I say to Dave that I want him to know he's done absolutely nothing wrong. My voice is shaky as I clear my throat, still unable to meet his eyes. Throughout all the years we've been together, my friends have been envious of our marriage. It should be acknowledged that Dave has been an exceptional husband. I laugh, but Dave doesn't reciprocate with a smile. Attempting to cushion the imminent blow, I confess my apprehension about discussing this with some friends, concerned they might not forgive me for causing Dave pain. As I focus my gaze over his shoulder, I discern no hint of a smile or softening in Dave's features. His lips move, yet he appears like a statue. He questions whether I'm going to hurt him, 
and the words, though simple, are compelling, drawing my gaze to his. I finally meet his eyes, but his stare remains firm and unyielding, as if scrutinizing something on a microscope slide. It breaks the spell, making me look away, feeling unnerved. I express my regret to Dave, explaining that I have fallen out of love with him and fallen in love with John. I aim to minimize the hurt as much as possible, but I need a divorce so John and I can be together. Pausing at this juncture now that the words are spoken, I try to discern any turmoil behind his mask, expecting to see. A throbbing at his temple, wet eyes, tightly drawn lips, his fist clenching. Yet, there's nothing. His reaction, or rather his lack of it, terrifies me. I can't help but glance at the baseball bat. The silence between us is agonizing, unbearable. I have to fill it. My carefully prepared speech is a thing of the past. I explained that I didn't want to hurt him until I absolutely had to. I hope he sees that. John and I have been incredibly careful, not wanting him to find out until it was absolutely necessary. Which is now. That meant limiting our time together. My concern for you, for your feelings, significantly restricted the occasions John and I could be together. Be together. Avoiding, you mean. I can't respond. I can't meet his gaze. I have no more lies left in me. I've exhausted them all. I can't lie to this man. Not anymore. I respect him too much. But I had hoped he wouldn't ask. Wouldn't be so direct. His words make it all seem sordid. My lack of response is all the confirmation Dave needs. There doesn't seem to be anything left to say. Or any point in apologizing again. I'm willing to hurt Dave. I know it. He knows it. Update. The room's atmosphere is dreadful. And I yearn to escape. The tension is nearly unbearable, and my nerves are so tightly strung that my skin prickles uncomfortably. While Dave isn't outwardly screaming in pain, I know him well enough to sense the internal turmoil. Anxiously, I wonder which of my anticipated responses from him will unfold. Regardless, I know it will be terrible. Something must break through for me to start my life with John. For what feels like an eternity, Dave stares at me until he acknowledges. Okay, Chelsea. My response is automatic and slips out before I can edit it. I question him, asking what he means by, okay. I assume he wants a divorce so he can marry the other person. His tone remains patient, his expression bland and neutral. I sit back, too stunned to speak. This isn't one of the expected reactions. Unexpected, out of left field, like a kick. I feel insulted. There are no questions, accusations, raised voice, red face or tears. After 28 years together, my husband isn't going to spend even 5 minutes questioning me. After months of agonizing over my affair with John and sleepless nights dreading this moment, I've been discarded in under 10 minutes, all without apparent emotion. I realize I need to say something but I must be careful. I consider how to break through Dave's reserve without losing John, a fine line. I bring up the fact that, after all our years together, he is willing to just walk away. Dave questions why I wouldn't agree to part ways, asserting that I've already emotionally left him. He wonders about the point of fighting and suggests preserving our fond memories by going separate ways. It's an answer, though not the one I was hoping for. Before I can pose another question, Dave continues, anticipating that I have papers for him to sign. Indeed, I have a signed and notarized divorce petition, but it's in John's car. We didn't anticipate progressing beyond the anticipated yelling, screaming and possible tears tonight let alone Dave examining or signing any papers. Before I can rise to retrieve the documents, John stands and exits. I observe him, sensing the tension affecting him as well. Amid the awkward silence that ensues after his departure, I extend my apologies to Dave, genuinely regretting the pain I've caused him. Dave rises, and my eyes involuntarily flicker toward the bat. He brushes off my apologies, insisting that true remorse would have prevented the whole situation. Heading to the kitchen for another beer, he effectively shuts down the conversation. John returns with the manila envelope, holding it at waist height. Dave takes two swift steps toward him. My heart goes out to John as he steps backward, stumbling over his feet, colliding with the couch's edge and landing with a soft thud. Holding the envelope now, Dave glances at me, his face flushed, realizing he's not presenting himself in the best light. I try to convey through my eyes that it doesn't matter, that I still love him. Turning to Dave, who watches me with an indifferent expression, I still can't read his thoughts, and I'm not entirely sure he won't attack John. I inform Dave that Mary is aware of our presence, and if she doesn't hear from us by eight, I instructed her to call the police. I add that if he wants someone to blame, he should blame me instead of directing any anger towards John. In response, Dave expresses that he does blame me, highlighting that I made numerous promises to him all those years ago, not John. He assures me that he doesn't want John to suffer any more than he's already going to. 
I question Dave about why John would suffer and what he means by that. Dave gives me a look, a kinder and more patient version, the kind he uses when explaining something I may not fully understand. He elaborates on the idea that, being a woman of 50, I am past the age of giving John children, making him go childless, a genetic backwater. That there is no worse punishment for a man than never experiencing the joy of witnessing a child's first steps or hearing them say data for the first time. He goes on to describe how John will miss out on the typical experiences of teaching a child to catch a ball, ride a bike, helping with homework, and teaching them to drive. Dave emphasizes that John will never be a hero to his daughter or a role model for his son. He speculates that our kids will likely want nothing to do with John once they discover what the two of us did. His words cause my blood to turn to ice, and I shiver, realizing I haven't considered the impact on the kids amidst the turmoil of my affair and the end of my marriage. I attempt to reassure Dave, telling him he doesn't have to tell them. Dave questions if I want him to lie to the kids as I lied to him. I hang my head, but he continues, emphasizing that John will marry someone he can never fully trust. He describes how John will be with someone capable of hurting him while professing love, someone skilled at hiding abhorrent behavior with acting skills. Dave prompts me to think about how John will feel the first time I inform him that I'm working late, going out with friends, or using the same myriad excuses I used with Dave to spend time with him. Shifting focus to me, Dave speculates about the future, when my looks start to fade in another five years, while John remains a trim-looking 40-year-old. He questions whether John will hesitate to leave me. Having seen all my perceived flaws, Dave mentions aspects like my crankiness due to PMT, my loud snoring and deep sleep, and other habits that John will soon discover. Offended, I leap to my feet, ready to retaliate, claiming that I'm not the only one who snores and pointing out my ability to color coordinate. I start to list Dave's faults, but a gasp from John stops me. His expression shows that Dave's points are resonating. I realize I need to get John out of here. Dave shrugs while I collapse back onto the couch, shocked and filled with anger and offense. Is this truly what he thinks of me? Has he harbored these thoughts throughout all these years? Update. I have so much I want to say. After months of doing my utmost to keep my affair secret to protect Dave, I now have an overwhelming desire to make him pay for not caring, for discarding me so easily. But the words won't come. They fail me as I watch Dave take a swig of his beer before tearing open the envelope. I look down at my hands, avoiding John's gaze, and can only hope he's not looking at me either. Dave mutters about half the value of the house, looking up at me. He disputes the idea, asserting that it was his before he even met me. Dave suggests I might get away with half the bank account, but there may not be as much in there as I think. He acknowledges the likelihood of splitting the difference in our retirement accounts at the date of our separation but mentions that I won't receive anything until he retires in 17 years. As he reads the rest of the document, he falls silent. I contemplate whether John's love for me can overcome the fact that we won't have the financial stability we thought we'd have, as I had assured him. Dave's words echo in my mind about the difference between an artist and a pizza, using John as a living example. What's the difference between an artist and a pizza? A pizza can feed a family. The silence drags on, feeling interminable. Finally, Dave looks up and comments that everything seems pretty reasonable except for the house, anticipating that my lawyer will charge me thousands to fight that. He then shifts the focus to the immediate future, wondering what we do now. He suggests I get a lawyer. And he contemplates packing a few things, but I interject, expressing my desire for him to leave right away. Dave considers alternatives, suggesting he could drop my belongings off at John's place next weekend. He intends to change the locks in two days, making it inconvenient for me to return, suggesting that if I've forgotten anything, I can email him. Dave asserts that I can take all the pictures off the walls, excluding those of the kids, as we'll divide those. He stresses his preference for no reminders of me, except for the crew's photo from last year, which I can't keep. I wonder what makes that particular picture so special to Dave. It was taken about three months into my affair with John, during a surprise Caribbean cruise Dave arranged. At that point, I still enjoyed being with my husband, and the photo captures a woman smiling after much love. I'm puzzled about why Dave wants to keep just that one of us. While I'm contemplating this, Dave turns directly to John and addresses him for the first time. He asks about John's current address, initially mentioning 42 Belmont and then correcting himself, noting that John moved a few months ago to 58 Gravelia. Noting that John moved a few months ago to 58 Gravelia, the revelation leaves me shocked. Dave knew about John's new address. Not only that, but he's known for at least four months. I grapple with the realization, questioning when and how he found out. We've been so careful, and I can't fathom how I missed any signs. I replay scenes of dinners, closeness moments, gifts, date nights, birthdays, our anniversary, mornings, nights, days, and time with our children. Yet in not one scene could I detect a change in Dave. I look at Dave as if seeing him for the first time. 
This is the man I have spent my entire adult life with. The man who held my hand and encouraged me while I gave birth to our children. The man who I nursed through influenza. The real one. The one where you can't lift your head off the pillow. Who nursed me morning sickness and an emergency. The man I should know as well as the back of my hand. The man I should be in tune with. Notice any change in. None. There's been none. I'm sure of it. I stare at him, marveling. A stranger. My husband of 28 years is a stranger to me. I've been thinking myself so clever, so careful, not giving anything away, such a good actress. But Dave is better, so much better. He knew and hid his knowledge from me. How could he? How could he hide it so well? If he truly loves me, he shouldn't have been able to. The thought triggers heat. I don't want to explore the logic of it. Had I truly loved him, would I have been able to hide it so well? But clearly, I didn't hide it so well. Dave knew, had known for months. I look at him. But it's not him from the here and now, it's him from a mere two weeks ago. I see him undressing me. Gentle, loving, cherishing. The lie. He knew. I think about how hard I'd worked to respond. To hide my guilt. How careful I'd been to ensure my expression was loving and responsive. I contemplate the tears I suppressed. Silently apologizing to John while reciprocating. Touching. And kissing. Pretending I desired to make love. The stress is present. The battle against the urge to flee. To recoil. The shame when my body betrayed my heart and climaxed. I had to resist leaping from the bed immediately after. Wanting to wash Dave's scent off me. Following the act, I lay beside him, sleepless while he slept, apologetic to both men. I've lied and betrayed both. I reflect on the days and nights where similar scenes played out, my heart pounding not from love or lust, but from fear of being caught. Anxiety over lies, stress over my performance, and the thought of my deception, my betrayal, being exposed, all for nothing. Dave had known. For months I've been scared, editing every word, conscious of every facial expression, nerves stretched to their limit, exhausted from hiding my betrayal and shielding Dave from hurt, keeping track of my lies, sleepless, a mental wreck, all for nothing. Did he love me at all? Ever? How long has he been pretending? A month, four, fifteen, twenty-eight years. All those things he said to John. All those awful things. What he truly thinks of me. I look at him and I want to cry. He's dry-eyed. It's me fighting tears. Me, nauseous from rage and rejection. I reach for the glass of Chardonnay. Wanting to douse the flames and rinse the bitterness from my mouth. It tastes sour. Dave removes the glass of wine from my hand. Holding John's half-finished glass in the other. He turns and walks toward the kitchen. Emphasizing the shift from ours to his kitchen. Over his shoulder, he casually instructs me to hurry. Mentioning that John is already at his car. The dismissal is evident, and I turn my head to find that John has indeed left the room. He didn't wait for me, and we won't be walking out together. Update four years later, closing the magazine. I realize I can't recall a single article or ad. Probably no loss. The content is likely outdated. Checking the dates on the cover, I confirm the magazine is three years old. I think to myself, surely a doctor's practice as large and well patronized as this one can afford current magazines, as I return it to the stack and select another. I continue my next round of board flicking waiting for my name to be called. When I hear Mrs. Smith, I don't react immediately. It takes a repetition for me to startle, feeling a bit foolish. Even after four years, I'm not used to being called Mrs. Smith instead of Mrs. Brown. I rise, heft my bag onto my shoulder, and head down the corridor to my doctor's room. The doctor greets me with, I explain that I've come to have my implant and replaced after five years. He acknowledges this, noting it's in my appointment notes, and suggests that I talk to my husband about sharing the responsibility and considering a vasectomy. He smiles, and I return the smile, responding with, maybe next time. I keep my face friendly and neutral, but inside I feel smug. My arguments with John about him having a vasectomy have been a battle of wills for months. Why should I continue to chemically poison my body when he can just undergo a simple procedure? It's not even an operation done in a hospital. The good doctor here could perform it, unlike the non-chemical option for me, which would be to have my tubes tied, something I've pointed out to John more than once. During our last argument over the issue, I remembered he'd said he'd had the mumps as a child. I asked him to get his seed fluid tested, thinking I could still have a win in our standoff and go off birth control. If the test came up with John having a low seed fluid count, the stubborn guy refused to get tested. But I'm also stubborn, so while still churning over his harsh words, I secretly salvaged some of his seed and sent it off for testing. Oh yes, I stored it correctly. Truly, turns out John doesn't just have a low seed fluid count. He's sterile. No seed fluid in his seed at all. None. Initially flush with victory, I intended to confront him with the results, but then common sense prevailed. I wanted a happy husband again and not a sparring partner. 
I wanted lovemaking, not merely the release of attraction. Somewhere I remembered the inconvenience of monthly bleeds. I like not having to deal with menstruation, so a replacement implant it is. After all it won't be forever. Dr. Jones is saying something, and I totally miss it. I apologize and ask him to repeat. He suggests swapping my implant in for the new type of contraceptive implant, explaining that it is rather fantastic. Not only does it offer contraception, but it also records my pulse at regular intervals during the day and comes with a variety of other recording tools we use for diagnostic purposes. So if you come in feeling unwell, all you have to do is pause by one of our scanners and it downloads information and we can see what's been happening with you internally since your last visit. Real space age stuff. Wow, I laugh. It sounds like something off Star Trek. What about side effects? I'm not going to end up the size of a barn, am I? Or grow whiskers or something. And is it like implantin in that most women stop bleeding altogether? No, nothing like that. Less disruptive than implantin. But with all its benefits such as stopping or at least lessening the heaviness of blood flow. Okay, sounds good. Dr. Jones turns to his monitor and clicks on one of the icons on his home screen. The what? He murmurs, rubbing his neck. What the? I look at him and then the screen, wondering at his confused tone. How long did you say you've had your implant in? He asks, turning toward me. Five years. How is that possible? Are you certain? It appears you already have a Vanguardian implanted. All your medical information has downloaded. Confused, I ask. What? The doctor explains that I must have been in within the last 18 months. Since that's how long they've been approved and available. However, I protest, stating that I haven't been to a doctor in two years or more. He turns back to the screen, and even in profile, I can see he's gone pale. He mentions that there's information going back four years, and questions the presence of WAV files, which are audio files. He speculates that there must be a glitch, suggesting that someone else's Vanguardian might have been accidentally linked to my patient card. However, the timeline doesn't add up, and he's perplexed by the inclusion of a Google map with a flag showing the clinic. To resolve the mix-up the doctor suggests examining my implant on. My head is spinning as I move to the examination bench and lay down. I turn my head away as I'm a little squeamish about needles and the like. It's definitely a Vanguardian, he says, and I can hear the confusion in his voice. It's the same as the ones we implant except for being a smidge longer and wider. Hem. I swivel my head and look at the doctor comparing my implant with an image on the screen. My eyes are drawn to the top of the page. Vanguardian. Seeing it written jogs a memory. I know that name. That was someone's pseudonym on the amateur writing site where Dave was reading about cheating wives. A coincidence. The rest of my appointment passes in a blur. We'll sort this out Mrs. Smith. There has to be some sort of cross signal or something in your old implant. Or maybe you were part of some test group or something. I'll get our tech guys onto Vanguardian and we'll be in touch. I nod and walk back to the reception area. I pay my bill and head to my car. With my hands on the wheel, snatches of conversations from the past spill into my already overloaded head. Update. There's a clause in my contract stating they own all my research and inventions. Even if I work on something at home during my own time, I can't patent it for at least 12 months after resigning. Dave's favorite part of his work was research and innovation. It was his forte. In my mind's eye, I see Dave seated on the couch with me and John. I envision his faded jeans and casual polo shirt. I recall the shock of our meager savings when dividing assets and his insistence on keeping the framed photo from the Caribbean cruise taken three months into my affair with John. Stunned, my hands dropped to my lap. I had the implantum inserted weeks before that cruise at Dave's suggestion to avoid inconvenient monthly disruptions during our vacation. I felt touched to have such a considerate husband. It's a different one from my previous choice. I changed doctors and clinics after separating from Dave because our old doctor, shared with Dave, was a friend of his father and the one who inspired Dave to enter medical research. Continuing with Dr. Black would have been awkward. Dave knew about John. He must have known from the start. Somehow, he convinced Dr. Black to implant a device he developed, a Vanguardian. Mine had a GPS locator and the ability to record voice files. It seems illegal. I don't recall consenting, but I signed something. Regardless, I should sue Dr. Black. I didn't know what I was signing. He has retired and is currently residing in Brazil, where his significantly younger wife is originally from. The question arises, can he face extradition from Brazil, similar to German war criminals who sought refuge there during World War II due to the absence of extradition treaties? Another puzzle emerges as I contemplate the purpose of developing an implant equipped with GPS and recording capabilities. It seems unlikely that its sole purpose is to track me. 
The realization dawns on me. Military applications. Yes, military use would indeed find such technology valuable. I recall Dave's involvement in a project aimed at developing a device for diabetic soldiers, ensuring sugar regulation without the need for daily injections or medication. In light of this, a GPS locator and recorder seem like a logical extension. Various scenarios and potential military applications swirl in my mind. It becomes clear that around the time of our cruise or shortly thereafter, Dave must have resigned from his job. This revelation explains the dwindling state of our savings, which I had not monitored closely. With Dave managing bills and me using my credit card, I remained oblivious to our financial situation. Could the cruise photo be a keepsake commemorating his resignation? After all, Dave had personally arranged for its framing. Could it have been the scanner for the implant? Surely not. Deep inside I know that's exactly what it was. That's why he suggested hanging it in the hall by the coat rack and why he opposed me having it. He knew I might reframe it or give it to the kids, who could have discovered its true purpose. The enormity of how I've been deceived leaves me stunned. It all appears so unbelievable, like something from a Jason Bourne or James Bond movie, yet my gut insists it's true, all of it. It feels as though there's a vice tightening around my chest, making it hard to breathe. No wonder he didn't seek revenge in the divorce. He had already done it, at least financially, and I can't do anything about it. Dr. Black is likely beyond reach. And Dave, being Dave, probably secured my signature on a consent form. To make matters worse, it's been almost four years since Dave and I finalized our divorce. While I'll receive a portion of his retirement funds, I suspect the millions he earns from Vanguardian are funneled through corporations, and I won't see a penny. I touch my arm where the new implant lies. I can't even confide in John. Things are already shaky at home without me revealing how thoroughly my ex-husband deceived me. Now Dave lives in the Algarve, and the kids rave about his beachfront villa, though we rarely talk. In a daze, I pull into the driveway of the small run-down cottage I share with John. I can't recall the trip home. I hope I didn't run any red lights. The last thing I need on top of today's revelations is a traffic infringement notice. On autopilot, I unlock the door and enter the lounge. John is on the couch. Um, Chelsea, we have to talk. Only then do I notice he's holding hands with a girl who looks no older than 30 but is undeniably pregnant. She doesn't have much time left. Two glasses of Chardonnay sit on the table in front of them. Second story. My BF of four years cheated many times and he found out about an old friend of mine and wants nothing to do with me anymore when I went to jail. My boyfriend was everything to me. We had a great bond and friendship inside our relationship. He did cheat on me a lot. I'm a chubby girl but he's in great shape with a handsome face. This will necessary to say for the below. He's cheated on me with many girls, his ex, child's mom, even got her pregnant into a year of us dating. When he told me about the pregnancy I felt so hopeless. I did break up with him and spend a lot of time drinking with co-workers. A co-worker grew fond of me but I was always honest about my relationship. My ex was in contact with me for a bit but I didn't let it get too far nor did I hang out with him. He did end up getting an abortion but that didn't stop him from still having sex with her so I have him a lot of space. He did call, text a lot wanting to be together. With the old co-worker I did let him take me out on two dates. Only told my ex about one and he lost it. He forgave me but he retaliated by being with another woman. My ex stopped believing in love prior to me but he told me I brought that back for him so he was hurt. I ended up telling my co-worker that I was grateful but I didn't want to lead him on so I paid for the second date. He wasn't very nice to me at all so I cut ties with him. I quit a while after and got a new job. A couple months ago, my landlord kicked out my roommates and I due to one of the roommates fleeing and not paying rent. She didn't want to deal with it anymore so I had no place to go. I told my ex and we were together again and he didn't offer me a place. It was either move across the country with my godmother or rent a room in one of the most dangerous cities in my state. I said goodbye to my ex because I was just going to go to Florida. He was sending me places to live but I was hoping he'd let me stay with him. BTW. He offered me a place to stay a week after I moved into the new apartment. It was already too late I gave in my deposit. I did remember that my old co-worker had an aunt we both worked with, with a vacant apartment in her house. I messaged him after not speaking for almost a year and a half and he was kind about it. I ended up moving in. I told my ex about the place but not how I got it. My old co-worker assumed I was single so he would bring me fruit and try so hard to see if I need renovations and stuff. He kept coming over because his grandpa lived downstairs and his aunt told me he's never visited his grandpa until I moved in. I told him there's no need to bring me a nothing or do anything and to stop flirting with me, that I was in a relationship still. He wasn't so nice. He was being an asshole to me very badly. I made the mistake of being late on rent due to hours cut at my job. I ended up telling the co-worker if he can speak to his aunt for me because I was doing Uber Eats to make up extra cash and it wasn't enough. I went to jail last weekend for a suspended license I stayed for five days. My ex was there for me the whole time. 
The old co-worker ended up telling my cousin I'm missing due to me telling him I'm doing Uber and I have a warrant I may not be out to pay rent. My co-worker ended up saying I was his girlfriend. I confronted him when I came out but all he says was he's drunk and he laughed at me. My cousin inadvertently informed my ex about a guy I was spending time with and invited out for Halloween one year. This revelation angered my ex, leading to hurtful words and accusations. I explained that there was no physical intimacy between me and this man, as I believed our relationship wouldn't continue after the pregnancy. Despite my assurance, my ex refuses to communicate, deeming me a liar. Moreover, he's now claiming I transmitted an STD to him, even though I know he was the one who gave it to me. The initial test showed negative results for him, but later tests turned positive. Feeling lost, I grapple with the situation. I never cheated on him. I only attempted to move on during our break, eventually reuniting with him despite his multiple infidelities. I'm struggling with intense emotions, torn between guilt and the belief that he finds it easier to hate me than to end the relationship willingly. He even suggests I stayed with him because I couldn't find someone better looking. Despite being a plus-size woman, I am confident in my appearance and have received attention from various individuals. The situation has left me feeling devastated and unsure of how to proceed. He was my best friend. He tells me he still loves me but he never wants to be with me again and laughs that he messed with a dirty woman due to the positive STD results. I just can't deal with all this bad luck right now. Thanks for joining us on this chapter of Relation Tales. If you were moved by these stories, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Don't miss out on the upcoming emotional roller coaster of relationships. Your support means the world, and we can't wait to share more compelling tales with you. Until next time, remember, every relationship has a story worth telling. See you soon.